Good. Okay. So next up, uh, we have Beetle Banks with uh, Sarah Nizzi from the Xerces Society and Jake Kundert with the Iowa Valley RC&D uh, discussing the beetle banks out there on the poor farm that Jason Grimm touched on a little bit, um, but I'm sure they're going to expand more on that and the whole process behind that. So uh, Sarah and Jake, the floor is yours. All right, great. Thanks, Olivia. I will be sharing my screen and starting us off. And then Jake will jump in and then I will close out for the day. Um, so yeah, what a great meeting this has been thus far. I've done quite a bit of work with Grow Johnson County and also kind of helping do some planning and bouncing ideas off with Jason Grimm in regards to the historic poor farm kind of in general and the whole the total acreage there. Um, so just really neat to see all these different perspectives and all the different things going on. Um, lots to talk about. So Jake and I today will be focusing on the habitat work um, in regards to beetle banks, so making space for beneficial insects. Um, but first, I'll do my own introduction. I'll talk briefly about Xerces and then we'll deep dive into that. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Sarah Nizzi. And I'm a farm bill pollinator conservation planner and NRCS partner biologist. I work with the society as a partner biologist to basically help um, implement habitat on private land with landowners and producers through NRCS and their programs, as well as state offered programs. Um, anyone that's interested in pollinators or diverse habitat um, is free to reach out. I also help train NRCS staff and partner staff on things pollinator um, related and native plant related, plant ID, weed management, site prep for plantings, uh, seed mixes, do a lot of those. Um, so kind of anything under that umbrella, um, do a lot of education outreach such as this and produce publications too. And Jake, um, I'll let you do your own introduction. But for those of you that aren't as familiar with the Xerces Society, we're an international nonprofit organization based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we have about 50 of us on staff and half of our staff work within the pollinator team. So we, as a pollinator team, are out there trying to diversify agricultural landscapes across the country as well as within other countries. Uh, we're working with growers in Canada currently and Mexico and possibly um, Brazil or somewhere in South America. So. I am within the public sector as an NRCS person, as well as several others, um, but we have folks in the private sector that work with larger growers, entities, um, DOTs, et cetera. We have a small endangered species team that basically works to give voice to all the imperiled species that don't often get a lot of attention. A pesticide team that works really hard to keep us informed on all things pesticide related and just a few that do urban conservation. So working with cities and towns, college campuses, um, our volunteer ambassador program, et cetera, to get pollinator um, habitat in those spaces of the world. I added this map just to kind of see where our pollinator team lays out um, within the United States. So we're scattered pretty well all over. Uh, we lost a Southeast person recently uh, to Morocco. So uh, we've got to fill that position and kind of fill in that gap. Uh, but again, we're kind of split between working with NRCS and working within the private sector. So I don't think it's news for anyone here that insects um, have had a tough time in recent, um, recent years and have really gotten attention in the last decade or so. Um, especially through honeybee colony collapse and the monarch butterfly population declines. Where studied, we're seeing that diversity, abundance, and biomass of insects and other invertebrates are decreasing, and they are decreasing at a rate um, at which we should be alarmed. Um, this is going on locally and globally. Um, globally, 16 point 5% of vertebrate pollinators, so that's birds and bats, are facing some degree of extinction. Over 40% of bees and butterflies globally are facing some degree of extinction. Um, in the U.S., over a quarter of our bumblebee species are facing extinction. Um, so lots of things going on, uh, but the good thing is that these um, invertebrates and insects and these species 
are able to be resilient if we um, allow them that opportunity. And when it comes to beneficial insects, um, they basically do the work, um, do a lot of work for us. And when we see, see these declines and uh, when we have agricultural practices that aren't necessarily in their favor, uh, we end up spending a lot of time, money, and resources doing the work um, that they could be doing. So as beneficial insects decline, pests and other things um, are just willingly ready to take their place. Gosh darn. Okay. And a lot of folks, you know, might think of insects as something that's not super desirable or worth really spending much of their time or anything to get excited about, but only 2% of described insects are considered pests and the rest are beneficial to ecosystems and food webs. Uh, in terms of beneficial insects, there's a huge uh, diversity out there. Ground beetles are what you know we think about a lot uh, with Grow Johnson County, but we also have lady beetles, rove beetles, tiger beetles, predatory wasps, parasitic wasps, mites, um, stink bugs, hoverflies, lace wings. I could go on and on, and they all have a unique job and role and a service that they kind of bring to the table. Uh, for example, lace wings, which is pictured in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, they look rather dainty and, you know, don't really appear to be much, but they're quite predaceous and ferocious. They can travel uh, a great distance um, in terms of being a bug and also are able to prey kind of at lower temperatures and lower, um, you know, when there's not as much light around, uh, which not every, you know, insect is going to be out there doing that job. Hoverflies as larvae are predaceous and considered predators, but once they complete metamorphosis, they are then considered pollinators. So we can get kind of a double benefit in that regard. And uh, should also mention that the importance of beneficial insects, there's so many. Um, decomposition, nutrient recycling, uh, adding habitat for them adds aesthetics to the farm, as well as increasing biodiversity for beneficial insects and a wide array of other wildlife. Uh, potentially, you're reducing management costs and reducing the need to um, put in, you know, more inputs or insecticides. So we know that pests thrive in monoculture, so how can we support beneficial insects? And basically the bottom line is they're, they're going to need more. They uh, require diversity in order to thrive. And so habitat is the way that we can provide for beneficial insects as well as you know, a broad, way of, broad array of wildlife, as I think we, we all know, but habitat ensures that there's nesting cover available, um, food, so it's pollen, nectar, larval host plants, um, breeding opportunities. They're able to find one another without traveling uh, a large distance. Overwintering shelter is really critical and refuge from pesticides. So the habitat feature that we'll focus today is beetle banks. Um, it originated in the UK as a way to um, create habitat in replace of all the native hedgerows that they had um, removed to expand agriculture. Um, they realized that uh, you know, their native hedgerows had served a really good purpose and they were getting a lot of um, conservation biologic control out of it and you know, didn't have them, so what can we do? So they created beetle banks and it's been widely successful and adopted within the UK. They have cost share programs in the UK to install this habitat. In the US, there's been more of a focus on it in the Pacific Northwest and in parts of the Eastern United States, but it's still um, pretty experimental within the Midwest. So there's not a ton of research um, within the United States and you know, not a lot of beetle bank work going on um, in the Midwest. So here at Xerces, we've been partnering with a number of farms to kind of expand that work and expand our knowledge of this habitat feature. So basically they're long linear strips that are planted either within or adjacent to crop fields. Um, they make most sense for agri or organic farms because they really need to reap that benefit of um, pest control because they're not using any sort of insecticides um, as well as being basically a safe haven. So you're not um, accidentally, you know, exposing them to any lethal or sublethal um, issues through, through pesticides, particularly insecticides. 
And the main purpose is to provide shelter for ground beetles. Um, so allowing that nesting to occur and being able to overwinter and continue being in and near the, the crops um, all season long. Traditionally, they've always been planted with 100% native bunch grasses, but we have been experimenting with diversifying that and adding a wildflower component. So generally with our new beetle banks, they're about 60% native bunch grasses, 40% um, wildflowers, and that native bunch grass component is basically the key to um, the overwintering and nesting habitat for ground beetles. They can be two to six feet wide, you know, that really depends farm to farm and usually are the length of the crop field. They can be planted on a berm, uh, which is very traditional, and the advantages of that is basically having the habitat be drier sooner in the season so that those critters are then encouraged to get out sooner and in, in the season into the crop fields. Um, but if you have a well-drained area, you can plant them on flat ground. Native plugs or seed um, can be used, it just kind of varies on uh, what your goals are and, um, you know, there's pros and cons to that. Pictured here is another farm that we've partnered with out of Cedar Rapids, Cultivate Hope Urban Farm. Uh, they planted on flat ground and they planted with plugs. So the bottom picture was sent to me in like April of this year. And the picture above I took last week. So they planted with plugs and you can see that makes a pretty big difference um, in terms of jump starting things, but just uh, another farm to look at. Uh, so now I'm going to kick it off to Jake, and he's going to get into the nitty gritty of what we've done at Grow Johnson County. Thanks, Sarah. Hey, everybody. I'm Jake Kundert. I'm the Food Systems Director at the Iowa Valley rcd and And part of that role, I get to work on this project, uh, Grow Johnson County, um, with some uh, co-workers and a whole group of volunteers that come out on the farm, and we grow five acres of organic vegetables that we uh, distribute to 15 hunger relief agencies in Johnson County and then we use the production model to provide educational opportunities for people in the community that want to learn more about organic farming um, food production. So we got started up in 2016. We've grown over the years and now at a point where we're on about five acres um, nestled kind of up in near the, the building complex. Um, I know Jason gave you all a tour before, so you might have a kind of be oriented already, but we're kind of up in the, um, up ne next to the buildings up there in the photo here. Um, and we got really interested in beetle banks uh, after attending a field day, a PFI, Practical Farmers of Iowa field day, uh, a few years back at Grinnell Heritage Farm. Um, and they had really nice established uh, beetle banks on their farm. Prior to that, I'd been really battling Colorado potato beetles for years and years and years on all the farms that I worked at. Um, and they're just kind of a, a, an annual challenge that you just kind of have to deal with. And, um, and Andy, Andy Dunham, who's the farmer at Grinnell Heritage, uh, was showing us these beetle banks and said that after he had these established and the beetles had kind of come in uh, and really developed their population out over the years, that he wasn't having to spray for potato beetles anymore. Um, and I think the previous year it was like, it seemed like I was out spraying, you know, organic insecticides, um, you know, a couple, every couple of weeks, just to try, to try to stay ahead of them. So I was <clears throat> very intrigued by that, that idea and, and just seeing them and seeing how small of a footprint, how, much, how little amount of land that they take out of production, um, how just kind of cool they look that you're just able to see these native plants in such a small little area. Um, it, it was kind of just a no brainer for us. So that's when I got in touch with um, Sarah um, at Xerxes and we just kind of went from there. So in this presentation, um, if you wanna go to the next slide, we're gonna dive into the kind of the, the background planning uh, that went into developing the beetle bank uh, sections on our farm, uh, the planting season of planting that we put in that was in 2019, and then kind of the ongoing management from there, what we've done to keep up with them. So a little bit of background on planting, and I, I'll just kind of go through these quickly, but if, if anybody has questions on these things, I'm happy to elaborate on them later. But the kind of things that were top of mind for us when we were designing them 
was this thing that mentioned that Sarah mentioned about the that ratio of grass to forbs, how the traditional one is really heavy on grasses, uh, but we were kind of excited about adding in some more forbs. Uh, and especially as an educational site, I really like the idea of being able to bring in a lot of native forbs that people might not be familiar with. And the design of the beetle bank is just so accessible that you can really go in and kind of pinpoint all these cool plants that people aren't necessarily familiar with. So we were, we kind of went a little crazy on, on the species that we were planting. Um, so yeah, ratio of forbs to grasses is a thing um, that is uh, important to think about in the beginning. Uh, the consistency of having uh, flowers in bloom all year round. Uh, so things that will bloom early in the season, things will be bloom late in the season and all throughout to be providing those nectar resources for pollinators throughout the year. Um, we went pretty heavy into making sure that we got local ecotype seed from the supplier that we got the plugs from. Um, the, the distinction on whether you want to go from seed or whether you want to go from plugs. Um, and I can talk a little bit more a little bit later on about why we opted to go for plugs. And then when to plant in the year and then thinking about, okay, I want to plant in August or July. Where, what's the sequence of things that I need to do before then to get my, my, uh, my bed prepped, either even that season or, or the season before, and trying to be managing those um, like pre-planting pre weeds, stale bedding kind of options. And then also what happens after that through the end of the year. Um, yeah, go to the next slide. So this is uh, an aerial map of where the Grow Johnson County Farm is at here. So you see our, our western block, uh, which is kind of on the left side here. We have, those are our north-south running fields. So the red lines are where all the beetle banks are. So we have beetle banks on either side of those, that, that big field. And then uh, west of this is the land access program. So you can see kind of the black plastic on the ground there. That's another farmer's ground out there. And then the east-west facing beetle banks, there's two that are just kind of running in parallel. And we, that's a main field road there, so we, we stopped off there. Um, so the north-south beds are 425 feet, I think. And then the east-west ones are 300 feet. So all in all, it ended up being somewhere around 1,300 row feet of beetle banks. They're all 40-inch uh, bed tops, and, uh, and that's kind of our standard um, vegetable uh, our standard size in our vegetable operation, and I'll talk more about that too, why that was important to us. But in general, with the wheel track areas, it ended up being about five foot total bed width. And we went with a three row bed system. So three rows of plants, 15 inches between row, and then a foot in row. So that was based off of recommendations that Xerxes had on ideal spacing for natives. And then we got into this, um, uh, this idea about trying to make sure that we had separate sections within the whole beetle bank that were taller stature plants and shorter stature plants so that um, that the shorter st shorter stature plants would have a chance to thrive and not be outcompeted by the taller plants. So the outer thirds of the beetle banks are running kind of lengthwise are uh, short and the middle third is tall. This is the planting list that we ended up with. I think it's somewhere around 35 plants or so. Um, in number, it's it's much, the I, I guess in, I guess you'd say diversity wise, it's a lot more species of forbs, but in, in just total quantity, it tends to be again, like 65% grasses. Um, so I'm happy to share this with anyone that's interested, uh, but the main thing I wanted to point out here um, so the grasses are in green, uh, grasses and sedges are in green, and the forbs are in red. Um, that most of the whole, all the beetle banks, about 40%, are just these three species, little blue stem, prairie june grass, and prairie drop seed. And that became kind of an important detail once we got into the planting process because we, we identified a way that we could really build inefficiencies with our planting based on just having kind of a, a large quantity of those, those three species. This is our timeline of that, that planting season. So uh, Jason went out on the, his tractor here, and this is a, a bed shaper. So we 
did kind of initial tillage with this bed former. So that is what created that berm. It's just a, a bent piece of metal that we put on the back of the tiller. Uh, and that's what makes that 40 inch bed top. Um, it's resting a little bit on the sod, so it's not making a nice kind of fine bed top, but it, it did what we needed it to do. Uh, so we did that in May, June, um, kind of around the time. This was a really wet spring. So we were trying to get in as we could to do this tillage while we were doing other things, other planting things on the farm. So that happened around May, June. We then once that initial tillage was done, we came in with this same tiller without the bed former and we would do these stale bed passes. So just setting the tiller as high as we can on that bed and really just trying to knock back like that top little inch of soil to try to kill any weeds that had come up um, uh, over time. And so that's just kind of that pre-planting weed management. We planted in late August of that year. And then the our idea with, with the beetle banks is just try to make them as similar to our vegetable production as we could. Uh, so we plan on actually just cultivating the habitat. So we had, that's the reason why we planted it the, the way we did, which I'll get into next, uh, was that we can actually use our cultivating tractor to go through and, and actually cultivate the beetle banks. So I, I believe I cultivated about twice, once in mid-September. It was pretty dry after we planted, so I wanted to make sure that they got nice and established. Cultivated in mid-September and then again in October. And because we planted a little bit later in the year than is probably ideal, we were monitoring as it started to have some frost that uh, the plants didn't heave um, in the later part of October. So this is what it would have looked like. This was the day that we planted. So we did one more, you can see the kind of the grasses that are coming up, the grass weeds that are coming up in the beetle bank there. So that's when we would come through with that, that stale bed tillage pass and just knock back all those grasses that had, uh, grasses and other weeds that had come up over time, just to try to, you know, take care as much of the limit, uh, I guess limit the weeds that are coming up, um, trying to reduce the seed, the weed seed bank. Uh, as best we could before we got the plants in the ground. Um, so the, the day of planting, we used, a, this is a water wheel transplanter. So this is the view from the tractor. This is uh, me and my coworker, Michi Lopez. We put those three predominant species, the uh, June grass, prairie drop seed, and little blue stem on the back of the tractor here. And uh, set them up in a way where we knew we could be planting in diversity as we were going, which is kind of the trick of the whole thing is trying to, you get 4,000 plants show up on the farm. Uh, how do you figure out how to put them out? So each beetle bank has the same number of each plant and you're kind of accounting for diversity within the beetle banks and then accounting for these different sections that are short and tall. Uh, so we just put, uh, we organized the plants based on this tall, short stature um, metric put them on different uh, hay wagons, made them very clearly labeled uh, as what they were. And then uh, the three of us, Jason uh, driving the tractor and then Michi and I on the back, planted those, those uh, three kind of predominant grass species. And what we did is figure out that we could plant uh, these, so I'll take a step back on planting. So these water wheel transplanter works uh, by these drums, these, these green drums on the bottom have those little teeth on them and those teeth make dibbles in the soil. And so that is what sets us so we know that our rows are 15 inches apart and then each one of those dibbles is six inches apart in row. So if we want to plant foot spacing, we just plant one and then skip a hole and then plant one and then we're planting every foot. So it's a really easy way, way to get straight rows and have your kind of set spacing. And so we knew that these three species were going to be about a, a well, anyway, we planted two in a row and then we skipped one. We left a hole for that we can come back and plant with a different species. So we went through and we were able to get all four of these beds planted with these few species um, in a couple hours. And then all we had left was all these other um, four and some of the sedges and some of the other grass species that we were, that we had maybe one or two of each. And we were able to just plant those by hand with the whole crew of volunteers. I think the really nice thing about having 
this setup in a way that we were planning to manage them like we would manage our vegetable plants is it kind of set us up to have really solid weed management at least in that first year so the left picture here is before the right is after this was the first cultivation pass uh so you can see some of the little kind of purslane and uh, pigweed and little things coming up that are pretty common that we see across the farm on the left and then on the right is after I came through with the, the that case tractor with the, we have Tillmore finger weeders, uh, which are, if you're not familiar, they're just kind of like these, um, they're round implements. They sit underneath the belly of the tractor and they have these long rubber fingers on them. And what they do is they'll, they'll roll on the soil. And as long as the weeds are smaller than the, the your planted crop, or in this case, these natives, they'll kind of wrap around, they'll roll along the row and they'll just knock out the little weeds, but leave your kind of rooted crop in the ground. So they take care of in-row weeds as well as uh, between-row weeds. So they're a really effective cultivation tool for us on the farm. Um, so you can see kind of the, the, the busted up sod, even in-row is kind of where it's getting in and that's what makes it a really kind of key tool. So this worked pretty slick. We were able to knock back a lot of those common annuals that we see on the farm and set us up for um, we knew we were still gonna have challenges with kind of these perennials uh, and, and more, I don't know, aggressive weeds that we see year after year. Uh, but this at least gave us a step up in that first year. So that was that first year. That, so we planted in late August, we cultivated September and October and then sat all winter long. And then the next year is once we, we had to move into kind of the mowing and string trimming and hand pulling kind of uh, process of, of management. And we did a couple mowing passes. We have a, a kind of a, it's a seven foot um, uh, big mower we have on the back of the tractor. So we would just kind of set the deck as high as we could and drive over top of the beetle bank and just knock back any of those weeds that came up. We did that maybe once in the beginning of the year and then after that, and once we started getting some of the flowers to come in bloom, we would just go through with a string trimmer and just be a little bit more precise and just knock back the weeds, but leave the plants that we want a lot of those to grow up. Um, we have done a little bit of hand pulling, mostly just thistles. Um, otherwise, it's been mostly string trimming. That's been the, the good management tool there. And then we manage the edges. So one side of the beetle bank is in our cultivated field, the other side is in a field road. So we can kind of manage the edge that's on the field road just through our normal mowage, mowing uh, uh, passes. Um, and I think over time, what we'll do is see if the plants are getting outcompeted or have, uh, have died, haven't uh, succeeded in, in the beetle bank, we can just come back through and, um, and add plugs in later where there's gaps. So what we should have done, if I were to go back and do it again, I think that I would have bumped up the, the tillage. And we were more like May, June, I think bumping it up more into April to have more time to do those early stale bedding passes and just try to knock back those annual weeds as best as we could a little bit more. We also, I mean, it's, it, you're kind of at the mercy of whatever the weather does. So that year it was super wet in the spring and then we just get hit that drought in the summer. And so it, once we, it seemed like once we did the tillage, the initial tillage, that's when that drought came on. And so if it's not raining, we're not getting weeds germinating. So I think the more you can bump your tillage into the early part of spring that you can hopefully get some spring rain on there to germinate those weeds, that's all the better. Um, and it, but it, if it did not, <laughs> if, it, if, if these, these, uh, these summer droughts continue on, uh, maybe even irrigating the beds to try to get those weeds to germinate. Because uh, I think over, I mean, the, the main labor of these, of installation and establishment and management is all just weed management. So the better you can do it the easy way before you've ever put the plants in the ground, um, it's better to spend time on that, I think. And I think I would have bumped up the planting more into, into July or even earlier in August. I think we, 
probably could have used a little bit more time for those plants to establish before winter. And I think just on maybe another another pass or two with the tractor to kind of knock back those weeds even more. And uh, I think based on some uh, of the publications that Xerxes has put together on growing out your own natives, I think we, and we have greenhouse space so we can do it. Uh, I think I would even grow out some of our own plugs from seed uh, just to be able to save some costs. This, so successes, I think, it, it, you know, we had, from being from plugs, we got to see the benefits of, of our work right in that second year. So seeing, this was in 2020, so the, the next year, if we got them all in, we already saw these flowers kind of blooming at different times of the year. Uh, I think seeing those golden Alexanders pop up in early spring was kind of like a relief, because you never, you put it in the ground, you never know what's going to happen, especially if you're waiting all winter. So I think to see those flowers come up was kind of like a, a mark of success for us. Um, and I think just being able to, on the next slide, we have some photos of the crew that came out and planted. And it was just a, a great opportunity to bring people out to the farm and, um, and spend some time putting these native plants in the ground, realizing they have a, a value and a benefit to agricultural landscapes. Uh, and, um, and the rattlesnake master came up, which is my favorite plant. So I was always happy to see that too. All right, sorry, get unmuted here. Um, yeah, thanks, Jake. You guys are awesome. And we've, him and I, you know, we've talked about this a lot. So it's, um, I think Beetle Banks is really getting some good traction and some good PR. And just last week, we did a virtual live from the farm field day with um, Practical Farmers of Iowa. So you can go to their website and search for that under events. Um, and the video is there, or you can go to YouTube and um, search Practical Farmers of Iowa. They have their own channel. Um, so it is also there. But if you really want to deep dive and see these plantings up close and um, talk even more in depth about them and um, about insects and the, the other pollinator habitats um, on the farm, you know, check that out. And lastly, we'll just close off close out with saying that, um, you know, beetle banks is just one of many different um, habitat uh, practices that we can install on farms that support pollinators and or beneficial insects. So um, Xerces, we've, you know, we experiment with a lot of different things. And um, another cool thing about uh, Grow Johnson County and the historic poor farm is, you know, their cover cropping system allowing things to bolt and to flower has been really beneficial for the pollinators. The amount of bumblebees and butterflies um, out there currently is pretty amazing. So um, any of those little things that can um, provide either food or shelter really makes a difference. There's just some key things that we want to keep in mind in terms of habitat practices. So always choose plants that are native to your region. Always um, select species that match your soil type. That's really, really, really important. If you're going to be spending um, costly money on seeds and plants, you want to be sure that they are successful and that you are making decisions that are site specific, um, including species with high insect values. So the native forbs that we know produce um, really good pollen and nectar for pollinators and beneficial insects, um, ensuring that bloom succession spring all the way through fall, um, you know, native bees, for example, emerge at different times. So some species emerge and are only flying um, in April or May, and they're out for two weeks at a time. Then they spend the rest of their, um, you know, the vast majority of their life, 11 months or so worth, you know, in their nest. So their um, emergence activity is a pretty short window. And um, so that could be spring, that could be early summer, could be midsummer, could be late fall. So there's always constantly kind of a succession of different um, flying insects out and about just depending on the time of year. So you want to ensure that they have all the resources available to them. Um, aggressive species can be advantageous if you're going to be dealing with high weed pressure or if you're dealing with um, wetter soils. 
grasses are really, really important. Sometimes folks get really wrapped up in flowers and food when it comes to pollinators, but grasses support nesting and overwintering opportunities and are low larval host plants for a slew of butterflies and moths. And so basically all in all, um, diversity is key. Um, as many species as possible that you can include in a mix, whether you're planting with plugs or seed, um, the more wildlife you're going to benefit. So I'd like to take a moment just to thank our Xerxes Society supporters and our large donors, um, very critical to what we do as a nonprofit. And of course, wanna give a huge shout out to all our, our farm partners and Iowa NRCS. Through the Iowa Conservation Innovation Grant, we were able to do um, the bulk of this beetle bank work. Um, and that grant just wrapped up in December of 2020. Um, but these are just all the farmers that have stood by our side and decided to do something different and experiment with us. Um, we, you know, we cannot improve our knowledge or um, conduct, you know, experimental research, et cetera, without um, them teaming up with us. As a nonprofit, we are donor supported. So if you like what we do and you want to be a member, I encourage you to join. And this is our contact info if anyone has additional questions after this event. Right. So Olivia, I don't know if there's time for us to take any questions or if there are questions or if we want to open it up to the, the large group of speakers. Yeah, I think let's do individual questions for Jake and Sarah first. Um, if anybody has some, I know we've been kind of slim on questions um, and we're quite ahead of schedule. Um, so we might even start social hour early if you hang tight. So, <laughs> but any questions for Jake and Sarah, please send them away. I've got one kind of teed up here. So, um, you know, these beetle banks kind of remind me of prairie strips, which are another practice that we do in field. Iowa State University has the strips program uh, that have kind of developed them. Is a similar amount of, uh, you know, kind of math and, and planning involved when it comes to area of the tilled acres versus the area of the beetle bank? Or is it a little more flexible um, and just kind of provides a habitat where you can put it sort of sort of metric rather than designing each beetle bank per field area. So um, for the moment, like these, at least in the US, our beetle banks are planted predominantly within vegetable row crop systems. Um, so they're gonna be smaller than our traditional prairie strips. And then again, that basically is gonna be determined by how much uh, production space they're willing to, to give up. Um, and in terms of species composition, they're designed a little differently that there is that higher ratio of um, native bunch grasses, which in Iowa for our prairie strips, um, you know, it's like 50-50. Um, so it's close, uh, but that, you know, the higher ratio of native bunch grasses is really for that ground beetle um, component. And that's, that's really what we're going for. Um, and again, like prairie strips, their, their main thing is in catchment and water quality, soil health, um, and, you know, a much larger scale. But not to say that you couldn't potentially, um, as long as you weren't involved with a USDA cost share, you'd have a little more flexibility to shape it like a beetle bank. <laughs> uh, with the species composition. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. No, definitely. It, it, yeah, I was kind of thinking like, how are they similar? How are they different? And that does explain it that, that they're keyed in towards vegetable systems, which, which makes a lot of sense. Um, kind of following up to that, a lot of the other uh, Xerxes Society programs like Leave the Leaves and things like that um, try to provide overwinter habitat these I'm assuming are left, you know, the bunch grasses are left to do their thing over the winter, you know, go into, um, uh, 
whatever that's called. Why am I blanking on that word? Anyway, uh, where, where they're providing some overwintering habitat as they're sort of still the roots and, and, and the bunch sort of literal structure of the bunch grasses is still available. Um, is anything else done to these over the overwintering period? Uh, so overwintering, no. I mean, just like any other native planting, you're just going to leave it as is. But you bring up a good point in terms of like future management. So, you know, down the road in a couple of years, they will need to be um, managed like any other native planting. So they could, you know, burn sections of it off, which is probably the easiest if you can get away with it um, or potentially uh, mowing. But, you know, just to keep that diversity and um, keep that planting success successful and, you know, encouraging that disturbance that native plants need. Oh, so you can burn the beetle banks then? Absolutely. If, okay, probably in the dormant. So yeah, like, like, you know, yeah, for Joe, or, <laughs> yeah, Grow Johnson County, they have so many, so they could, you know, burn half, leave half on, you know, probably each of them and then rotate kind of years so, yeah is um well just to follow up on the burn question we got another question in chat too but um is burning preferable or maybe you know the the desired option versus mowing it off or anything like that uh yeah i guess that would kind of depend on the scenario the thing about burning is really that's kind of dependent on your location and whether or not that's going to be allowed um, so talking with like Cultivate Hope, Urban Farm, you know, they're right like downtown in a neighborhood. Uh, although Lynn County is pretty progressive with things, there's no guarantee that that's going to be feasible for them. So we talked about how to mow and things like that. And, you know, Grow has more flexibility to implement that. And I think burning would be more beneficial just from like a labor time resource standpoint, like you don't have to worry about that vegetation being left there and whether there's um, possibly negative implications of, you know, dense vegetation from mowing. Um, so it's kind of just get it done. Um, I think there was a question in the chat. What sort of spacing between banks is best um, from John? So I think I'm wondering if you're asking that in terms of like you have a crop field, should you put it on this edge or put it on that edge? Um, I think the, the verdict is still out on that. We did some preliminary research with Luther College that was going to try and help answer this question. Um, were ground beetles present prior to planting and how far into the crop fields were they traveling? And I think Kirk Larson put out pitfall traps 20 to 30 meters into the crops. Um, so is that sufficient enough? Are they able to travel that far from the banks? Are they in the banks? Are they doing the services we like? Um, we did get results back from that research, but it's basically postponed until we can get more capacity and funding, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, and I also think it just depends on the, the cropping system, how big is your farm? What are your goals? What are your issues? Jake, I don't know if you've got additional thoughts on that. Thoughts on? on like spacing and how to determine where to place your beetle banks. I think we just figured that let's try to make them as centralized on the farm as possible so that no matter what direction the beetles choose to go in, they're gonna be moving into a production field. Um, and ours were kind of just based around what was, what was uh, fitting to our fields. So I kind of showed you there's like kind of the Western block and the Eastern block of fields. It seemed to make sense to put them on either side of the Western block and then right down the middle of the other one. And so, and then it was kind of just, what is our capacity to, to how much can we take on? How much can we put in at one time? How much can we afford? Um, so I think it's kind of a mix of all those things. What is the rough dispersal distance for beetles? That's a really great question for an entomologist, which I'm not, um, <laughs> for the record. <laughs> uh, there's beetles that can fly, there's beetles that don't fly. So dispersal really uh, depends on species or genus probably even. Um, 
but really they're not going to go terribly far. So the closer you can have the habitat to the crops is best or making it as easy as possible. Um, you know, Grinnell Heritage Farm, for example, does have, you know, beetle banks on the edge and the interior. Um, whether or not there's added benefits to that, you know, I'm not sure. It's just a matter of taking more crop ground out of production and also having to, you know, you just, it's, I don't want to say it's in the way, but it's just another component that, you know, yearly that's permanent long-term vegetation uh, that's going to be there for a long time. So you're committed to it. Okay, Anna. Yeah. Anna, you're essentially building a beetle bank if you have more grasses and flowers. <laughs> but I think, yeah, that could... Uh, that could have some benefits. I know I've got natives around my um, herb garden at my house. And this year, especially, I've seen a lot more beneficial insects than I have in the past. So kind of curious about expanding that and putting it into our larger garden. Do you have any, uh, so in a lot of urban areas, these have been popping up a little bit more, but the insect hotel kind of thing, which is a, a nesting thing primarily or, or only, um, is there any benefit to mixing those in if you have the available space to do, I'm thinking like backyard gardening, you know, uh, plant some natives alongside your, your garden area, would it still be helpful to add a, an insect hotel kind of a thing there too? sure i mean i don't really see why not um i will say for like the bee hotels more than likely you're uh drawing in solitary wasps more so than native bees um which could be more of a beneficial insect than anything so <laughs> so if that's uh what you're going for but um you know sure every little bit helps and um you know not cleaning your yards and leaving some sticks and brush and leaves in like a designated area or uh, rock piles or whatever. It's great habitat. Yeah, we call it the back 40, even though it's about 40 square feet at my house. So <laughs> always good to have a, a scrap pile. Yeah. Ah, Jake, do you want to touch on the, the traps? I think Kayla's here too. Is, she, is Kayla, still, Kayla still here? Well, she might have left. Um, Kayla Carter, who's leading this project with us, uh, was here. I think she's gone. Um, so malaise traps, I guess their benefit, well, I'll take a step back. So last year, I worked with uh, PFI to do a nectar resource assessment on the farm. So from May to October, every two weeks, I went around to 10 different spots on the farm, looked around in the section, saw what flowers were in bloom, and, and categorize them based on color and quantity. So we got a general idea of the abundance and diversity of nectar resources on the farm throughout the season. And looking at these different areas, like the, the, uh, uh, the pollinator habitat, the 13 acre pollinator habitat, in the woods, in the cultivated areas, uh, near the beetle banks, in some of our areas where we have more annual flowers, you kind of see this wide dispersal of floral resources. So that kind of got us thinking about like migration of pollinators and um, are there, you know, is there, are there more parasitoids in the pollinator field than in the cultivated areas? Or is it really kind of a moot point? Do they, you know, are they, are they, they're moving around enough on the farm that it's, that we don't need to worry so much about putting these more like in-field floral resources because they're happy to move from, they're having to move a hundred yards from the pollinator field to the cultivated areas and bring that benef their benefits to our, our kind of farmed areas. So this, the malaise trap project, we have three malaise traps set up and we're working with uh, Dr. Andrew Forbes at the university and then um, my coworker Kayla Carter is, is uh, coordinating the collection and, and analysis of that project. Um, so there's three malaise traps set up uh, and two are in kind of more of like wooded, One's in a wooded area, one's in the pollinator habitat area, and then one's in the cultivated area. And so they're collecting the flying insects that are in those different areas over the course of the season, and then see what's the migration, are there different populations in different sections. Um, so I guess the, the benefit of them is just trying to better understand 
what are the flying bugs on the farm? Are they site specific, location specific? What's their migration patterns um, on a very like finite scale? We'll see. We've so got mentioned the beetle banks in there at the poor farm and other places in Johnson County and Grinnell Heritage Farm and Neil Smith Wildlife Area. But how much more is there across the state? Is there quite a bit of it that's being done now? So there's um, a beetle bank that was planted along a prairie strip in northwest Iowa and um, uh, next to Clay, whatever county that is, O'Brien, drawing a blank. Um, one in O'Brien County, one in Winnesheet County, one in Lynn, one in Cedar, yeah, uh, Powashik and Johnson. So there's six that we know of in the state. But um, people are interested in asking about it all the time and I've had other farms uh, like one farm in particular in southwest Iowa that has um, shown interest, but you know, just haven't haven't quite worked together yet. Um, but I, I see it being something increasingly more popular. Yeah, could we use them in corn and soybean rotation to go after corn borers and other insects that are uh, damaging to crops? Um. Yeah, there's not a lot of research or experiments in that regard, especially a conventional crop field. Um, so yeah, maybe, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and the UK, they do have beetle banks um, with their agricultural systems that are up upwards of 15 feet wide um, and you know, 16 feet and possibly larger. Um, so maybe it's just a matter of, is someone willing to perhaps like do a buffer or not spray insecticide in a given spot to experiment with that to see if um, those beneficial insects could do that work at that scale. I see, thanks. Okay, any more questions for Jake and Sarah? 